Emma Clark from the Brooklyn Public Library here with John Woods, the Director of Programming at Nighthawk Cinema in Williamsburg. All right, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how long you've been in the neighborhood, what kind of work you've done? Yeah, um, well, I mean, do you want me to go back to what led me out here in the first place? Sure. Okay. So, uh, starting in probably, I guess, it'd be the, the maybe 80, I got into like punk rock and hardcore when I was, you know, probably 13, but it was more like bands like the Circle Jerks and the Dead Kennedys and Black, like bands were bigger. And then around like 80, 85, 86, I discovered there was a local scene happening here in town uh, at CBGB's, predominantly the Pyramid on Avenue A, CBGB's on 315 Bowery back in those days. Um, the Pyramid was on Avenue A across the street from Tom Couture Park. There was, um, you know, there was record stores, Bleaker Bob's, there was Venus Records on 8th Street. There was, you know, those places that were things were happening. Uh, I won't get too much into that, that's, that's Manhattan. But getting into that music and then going to shows starting when I was, you know, like 16, 15, um, and then getting really into it uh, was, was kind of what led me, was music really, what led me out to Longsburg in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, I had never really been out here. I had an uncle that worked um, at a meat cutting place on North Sixth Street, um, but again, I had never. I knew that he, you know, I had never really been out here before. Uh, and then Coyote Studios is also on North Sixth Street. Um, I knew some people that that worked there, um, but again, I really never had come out here. I had friends that lived on the South Side, some graffiti writer guys. Uh, and then I had other friends that lived from music that I knew that lived on Bedford and like I think it was North 10th and um, yeah so there was people that were out here I hadn't really this is like probably 87 88 and then um, in the late late 89 I came out here um, there was a place on South 4th Street called the Lizard's Tale which was a art space performance space um, there's there's you could see read about it in in the Times New York Times archive um, you know, it was it was something that was happening down here. It was it was right, right it was right on South Fourth Street. It was in the middle of, um, you know, the, it was a pretty busy block for a lot of different reasons. Um, but there was nothing really going on like that. Um, previous to that, there was you know right around the same time. Uh, this is right after that ABC and Rio started on Rodington Street, and that was very similar to where it was it was um, you know it was a music venue that had been an art space performance space. Um, it really wasn't exclusively music. It was just a place that was open to having, you know, young kids. Uh, we were all still teenagers, and that had that had. I didn't have a band yet, but a lot of my friends did. So, and I was really, in, you know, just dedicated to this to the scene and everything. So they were open to that. So that's what that place was. There was no walls inside it. It was just. It was just. Um, what do you call it? Just this beams. They had gutted it, um, you know. And we came out here. This is, I want to say, probably October of 1989. And uh, Citizens Arrest, a uh, band at the time, a band called Burn, a uh, band called The Manacled, and a band called Go. We're all playing playing at the Lizard Tale that day. Um, Gavin Van Vlack, who was in Burn, lived out here already at the time um, on the south side. So I think he was probably the one that, that found the place to uh, to book the show, to, to put, put the show on there. So we get off the L train and, um, you know, Somebody had told us that like the first stop was bad and the second stop was slightly better, you know, <laughs> which I guess was I guess was kind of true. Um, anyway, so we we got off the subway and we all kind of looked around and it was it put our hoods up and then you know, um, and really there was, you know, there wasn't many people on the street and this this is something that was you know, into the into the nineties when I finally did move out here, there really wasn't um, you know. It was nowhere near as that's the first thing that probably the biggest difference is that there wasn't really many you know there was, there was bodegas and stuff but there wasn't um many storefronts that that were actually stores anymore like um so we walked down the show was great but I remember the guy who um ran the space i don't, I don't know if he owned it, what his story was i never really got to know him that well but he remember him telling us don't hang outside between bands just stay in the space because um, you know, if if people figure out that there's maybe money changing hands here, I think it was three bucks for the show. Uh, so that was my first time coming out here, and um, yeah, I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty desolate. And um, even though I had some friends out here, it was it was um, um, it really hadn't been a, a big move from you know, a lot of uh, my friends living on the Lower East Side, chasing cheap rent, going further east. 
we actually used to call, when I finally did move out here, we used to call Bedford Avenue, Avenue E, because it was like the East Village, you know, into the Lower East Side, kind of moved over across the water. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I first came out here, and there was, uh, you know, another time, uh, that was, that show was actually December, I think, maybe, of, of 89. There was a show before that that didn't actually happen, and, um, you know, there was, there was still gangs out here, and, um, you know, a lot of these outlaw gangs, you know, you know, they would they would have swastikas on there as part of their, their. I don't think it was. I think it was just because that was the bad guys. You know, that's somebody else could speak to that better. The, the gang culture, you know. Um, so, two friends of mine actually had to run down the the tracks away from these guys that were chasing them because, that one of them had a problem with with there was swastikas and everything inside and you know. Um, anyway, they were really nice about it until they, they just, you know, got angry and, and then you know, chased them chased them away. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the first time I came out here was definitely for music. It wasn't for any other reason was that, you know, then I would visit my friends out here once in a while. Um, so, um, you know, I knew what was going on out here and I knew, you know, that there was, um, you know, things like Lizard's Tale, things like, there really wasn't any bars yet. And then when um, my bass player and my band and I both, um, we toured frequently and then, you know, we've, we wanted to have something where we wouldn't have to quit a, a job to go on tour, to travel, and then to come back to nothing and have to move back in with my mother, you know, to save money again. Um, so basically, like, uh, we both were, in, in addition to being in music, we were both huge cinephiles and both of us had pretty big VHS collections at the time. So really, we had the idea just, well, why don't we do a video store? There's, uh, you know, we'd see people on, this, on the L train with bags from Kim's, Kim's video, um, those purple bags. And then, you know, so we just figured this is something that we could just, you know, and, and honestly, we came from a, a place where, you know, we put out our own records, we, you know, booked our own tours, and, um, you know, it was, a, it was a big project that we had never really done. Some friends of ours, um, um, had opened a record store on 6th Street between 2nd and 3rd called Reconstruction Records. So we kind of saw firsthand, you know, you could just you could just do this, you know. You can you can build racks and put records in them and then get a cash register and, and just do it. So uh, we had, I think, between the two of us, maybe, maybe I want to say 700 or 800 tapes. <laughs> yeah. That's so, yeah. So, um, I mean, we, we, we got off the train one day. Um, and the, all that was out here at that time was the El Cafe. Uh, it was on Bedford near North 7th. Um, Deli Mart was on the corner. That was the great, it's still there, but it was different back then. Um, I think Planet, Planet Thailand, um, they had to change it into Planet Thai. They were, they were on Bedford back then. They were real pioneers. And there was a place called Osnot Stitch, which is a great kind of Middle Eastern restaurant near Teddy's which is on uh, Barry Street. Teddy's has been out here. You know, they shot King of New York in there and stuff. Um, and there was the Sweetwater, which is still there, but it was very, very different back then. It, was, it had, hadn't been open even a year then, and it was, it was a real, like, it was all people we knew from punk rock and hardcore that, you know, that had opened, uh, my friend Marina um, and her husband Steve had opened it up on, so we knew that there was, you know, but that was pretty much it. Um, oh, and Main Drag Music was on Bedford next door to us where the car service is now. The video store was at 209 Bedford. So we literally got off the train. We saw people we knew at the El Cafe. Hey, you know, we said what we were doing. And we, we walked. We, <laughs> this is exactly what happened. We crossed North 6th Street. And then near where, the, um, where Main Drag was. And they saw a storefront at 209. And it had a for rent sign on it. So we called the number. <laughs> and I think... I think the next week we met the guy there. He was he was owned Delimart at the time, and um, that was it. <laughs> we we decided to do it. We went to Teddy's and had a, a beer and decided let's let's, let's try this out. Um, so there really was um, you know we knew we knew everybody in the beginning because it was really not you know to have a video store and there was still a lot of artists out here back then. I mean there still is a lot of them are still here. Um, you know, Forrest Myers is still here. The guy that did those, the beam sculpture, they, they moved to Houston Street. He's still out here. Jim Klein, you know, he's still out here. Futura is still out here. You know, a lot of them are still here. But, but back then, you know, particularly on the north, 
north side, like close to Greenpoint, like there was there was you know warehouse spaces there, and a lot of people just had loft spaces, like Bedford Avenue, where I guess they're gonna where the drugstore was, what's gonna be the Apple Store? No, that was that was you know all loft space. People lived in there. One guy had a handball court. That's that's you know it was you know but you you um, there was just you know. And it was cool. We kind of, you know, that's that's kind of what I liked. And I and I found an apartment right above the video store for five hundred fifty dollars a month, which was doable. <laughs> it was it was completely tilted, you know. Um, so yeah, we we uh, we went to Dykes Lumber and bought sh bought wood and just built built shelves. And then um, I got like a hand me down uh, gateway <laughs> computer with a monitor like that to keep the stuff cataloged and and. Um, you know, I, I had I had worked in a video store, so I knew I knew you know how to kind of how to do it. So we just did it. It was it was three bucks for a new movie and two bucks for an old movie. Everything was tape, you know. And um, what what we you know, um, and what we did was I had gone to the UK and I bought about a hundred tapes that I knew weren't available in the states anywhere, or at least in New York. So it seemed like we had this great selection. Because we had the oh my god I never you know <laughs> that was, yeah you know so that that was kind of you know every dime we made we just put back into it and um, so you know people there was there was two of the video stores that that were on the on Bedford Avenue actually and actually somebody from the Times came down um, in '97 and wrote an article about how it was like how can you know there's nobody lives out here how can this place support three video stores you know so it was basically. The person who wrote the article had no, didn't really know what was up, and didn't understand our angle on it that we were doing, you know, a lot of more interesting films and stuff. And that's really what what floated us in the beginning was that was that you know, we worked in the store from open to close seven days a week for the first like you know, I don't know, maybe four months, something like that. So we got to know everybody, like everybody, you know, the people who had been here, who had grown up here, um, people who you know would come from Greenpoint. Um, because really there was nothing else out here like like what we were doing, and it was you know, and it became kind of like a barber shop for for film people. Todd Haynes, the director, who did you know, he lived out here. He'd come in. Maggie Gyllenhaal lived in Greenpoint back then. She'd come in. Um, you know, it was really if you were interested in film at all. But even then, it was like everybody was included. That was kind of I like I wanted it to be very populist, and that's kind of how how uh, um, Kim's had a reputation for being snobby, and we were just anti that, you know. <laughs> So, um, but again, it was, you'd, you'd, you know, you'd meet people and, and people I'm friends with for, you know, still to this day that grew up out here, um, you know, would come in and then you, you had, you had something in common in the beginning. So you were really kind of, uh, you know, and then people would ask for stuff and I could usually find it. So, um, you know, it worked, worked really well, you know, and I guess probably the first and there was no cash machines out here, you know. And people would come in and like, la like, where's the closest cash machine was Broadway, <laughs> which is an HSBC. And that was a Republic Bank back then. That was our bank, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I don't know how many blocks that is, you know. It's 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 a far walk. To, there was that was the only cash machine that was out here back then, <laughs> which sounds crazy. There was pay phones still, you know. Um, but you know, it was it was. We we were kind of used to it. We like the, the the sacrifices that you had to make to to you know, it was all worth it because there was no way we could do this anyplace else. You know, it was still very cheap out here, um, and you know, uh, really it was like the, the way the store looked. It was like it wasn't an, a, like a, a contrived aesthetic. It was it was the best we could do. The shawls were maybe a little uneven, and you know, um, it was rough because that you know we just we did we literally we painted it we tried to seal the bricks and stuff and you know we had to close up a window with a, a metal rack from a refrigerator one of those things so mm -hmm. um and really it was it was you know i mean i have a picture from my i lived on bedford and north fifth i took a picture on my roof at the turn of the century and there's not one person on the street like i would i would go after work i would go you know to get something at the grocery store that you know 10 or 11 and you wouldn't see anybody there'd be nobody on the street just you know um, it was really residential. There was flame cut steel was um, where the Whole Foods is going to be. That's Bedford and and um, I guess it's North Fourth. Yeah, that whole thing was a place called Flame Cut Steel, which did what you would imagine they did with that <laughs> name. Um, and there was other places um, on Triggs. 
there was places, pe- you know, around five o'clock, people would leave these jobs, and and, and there'd be plenty of parking. Um, you know, I mean, well, sometimes when school got out, that was, you know, we'd get a little, we'd have to sometimes lock the door because, you know, just whatever, it's just kids there with their friends, and they forget how to act for a minute, and they, you know, they get a little rowdy. Um, you know, it was we we you know, we got robbed. Uh, you know, again, but it was three young teenagers and stuff, and they didn't know what they were doing, which was kind of scary, you know. Um, but it was no big deal. It wasn't like it, you know. We didn't. We just that was that was life back then, you know. And I was I was really happy and very felt very lucky to have to have this thing that was you know relatively successful to what we were expecting back then. And I think that probably. I think it was 90, 90, 98 maybe. There was there, so Bedford Avenue was the L Cafe, and then there was a place called um, Max and Roebling, which was like two girls that made you know made clothes. That was like kind of like a fashion place. There was a there was an art gallery where um, Vera Cruz was still there was there back then, and then there was an art gallery. There was a lot of art galleries out here, but just like really bare bones, like mm-hmm. vanilla box. Um, you know, and there was a real, you know, there was a, there was tons of stuff going on, you know. Um, there was a place, the Old Dutch Mustard Factory, which is, which is gone now, but that was right, right um, on, I guess it was uh, Wythe and, right there, Wythe and, um, and maybe a walk past, um, Grand, I think it was, no, no, Metropolitan, I think it was, right, it was right there. Um, they'd have these, they'd have these parties in there and raves that was just insane and you know that wasn't really my scene but you because there was not much to do you'd go to these things and there was a place right by the bridge I mean huge totally you know illegal um, but nobody was really you know nobody really cared I mean cabs wouldn't come out of here back in those days you know and it's not better or worse than anything that's just that's just that was that time period you know um, and um, so I think it was 98 um, when um, the the mall, what's the mall now on on Bedford and um, um, I guess it's North North Fifth there. Um, they they kind of like changed it up and they were putting stores in there. There was not much in there. There's a place called Cubica, which was again like Kotor. It was it was like handmade clothes and stuff. And we were like, what the you know? <laughs> we didn't understand you know. Um, so there was that. Um, Mikey from Mikey's Hookup, he came a little bit later, maybe like 99, but he started out, he had a table on Bedford and he sold blank cassettes and mini discs or whatever. Um, so, uh, Coyote was still there and they had practice spaces and then, I believe it was 99 when um, what's Music Hall was called uh, North, North 6th Street back then, music venue. You know, I remember that like they got Ed N to X to play there. Like, oh my God, that's a you know, that's a big band, you know, for out here. Um, so that was probably when I first noticed it was changing. Um, it was probably '98, but still, it was pretty much you know, if I didn't know the people, they were kind of in the same the same like head where it was a lot of musicians. The artists were like probably the old school pioneers, you know. And they were already complaining. And this is something that I think is important to point out because, um, like, the Verb, you know, you remember the Verb? It, it was on Bedford and the Verb coffee shop. Okay, anyway. <laughs> no, it just they just closed. <laughs> but they opened, and I think I think it was two thousand one or two thousand. You know, and and they closed, and it was and it was sad. They were all great people, and I knew all of them, and there it was a wonderful business. But when they opened, like people were complaining, oh, this yuppie coffee shop, what the hell's going on in there? You know, mm-hmm. so it's. When we opened, people complained. Why is there three video stores? <laughs> yeah. You know, we don't need we don't need this. You know, it's 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 all it's, it's yuppies. You know, I mean yeah. that was always that was a word back in those days. Before people said hipster, they said yuppies. You know, so, um, you know, it's not like this this people complaining about the new residence is something recent. It was always happening, and I was working with the public out here yeah. since back then. So I, I definitely heard it every day and got kind of tired of it. And mm-hmm. my thing was always, well, then you know, do something about it, you know, um, and I stole, that's kind of coming to Nighthawk was, was, um, you know, the videos for business was really collapsing, um, I had a store here, store in Park Club, and another one down Bedford Avenue, and it just was, it was obvious around, like, 07 that it just wasn't built for the future, so I, I wanted to do something like this, 
and I went through a bunch of different incarnations of trying to do it. It wasn't going to happen. And then I, you know, uh, met Matthew that was, that, you know, wound up having the same idea to do it that I did. And then it, you know, then it, it worked out because he really understood that it's based on films, you know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that comes back to what I was saying was that, you know, if you're unhappy with the way it's going where you live, then, then you know, what's the point of then leave if you don't like it? Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to, believe me, if, if you want to um, get cheap loft space, I mean, there's plenty of places that you can go. It's just, it's not going to be as convenient. And it's not going to be handed to you on a silver platter, you know? That's that's kind of um, what gets annoying is when, well, you know, I mean, the, go be go to, go to East Tremont in the Bronx. There's plenty of loft space up there, you know? Mm-hmm. Or go to, uh, or go further east in Brooklyn. That's what a lot of people are doing now, you know? So, I don't know. I mean, it's always, New York is always changing, and I've, I've definitely seen it, you know, from when I was a young teenager, it was like, it was, don't go below 14th Street, you know? And then, then it was, don't go, you know, east of, of whatever, of 2nd Avenue, and then don't go east of Avenue A, you know? Yeah. Um, so. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, it has changed around here, but that's that's kind of always the way it goes. There wasn't, you know, you've see, I've seen it happen starting in the West Village, you know, the East Village in the, in the 80s, and then as the Lower East Side, you know, um, it, the only thing different different now is it happens way faster than it used to. Like say, Hoboken in New, New Jersey was kind of summer, but it took like ten years of of having like cool record stores and there was Maxwell's, it was a club, you know. But that's generally what, you know. I think that's probably true in every city. Once there's like a a, a music venue, that's when it starts to know. And that's kind of what happened out here. Was North Six really was a big turning point. But you know, I mean, in every year, I always think that it was as, as, as big as it's going to get out here. And every year, I'm, I'm proven wrong, you know. So, but after the video store, I still, you know, I went back to, you know, all this experience I had was kind of worthless for a while. So I went back to working in bars, mm-hmm. and and you know, I worked, and I so I was still, I never stopped working with the public out here for, even during the the years that I wasn't wasn't doing anything that was to do with film out here. So, um, yeah, I have. There's definitely like a Friday and Saturday night crowd that that comes out that that was never the case, mm. you know, you know yeah. it was it was house parties or art openings or whatever. There really not there wasn't that much going on. People were still going into Manhattan. I was still going into Manhattan, you know, to do to go to you know go places and stuff. So that's definitely changed now. Where it's it's a destination now where it wasn't yeah. a long time ago. Have you seen any recognizable changes in the community, particularly that you've been serving when you worked back in the video store and now? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, um, you know, you could, you could, you could get by on a lot less. Um, back then, you could, you could, you know, if you're willing to live, and like I said, it was, it was pretty common to like buildings on down on Kent. You know, they were all, it was all like, you know, just kind of raw, improvised living. You know, um, and nobody really saw. I don't think anybody in real estate saw them as having any value at all. Mm-hmm because there was really no, you know, um, there was nothing out here and back then to attract anybody who had money, you know, um, to live out here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it has, it definitely has changed. Um, you know, you, you don't hear Spanish on the street as much as you used to. Um, Greenpoint's still pretty much, I mean, that's changed. I, I actually lived up there after I left Bedford Avenue. Um, about 10 years ago for a year and we were I was kind of it was, it was pretty much all Polish I lived up on, on Diamond Street between Norman and Nassau and that was still pretty much all Polish but I know that's changed now too so but that's you know um, that's the way the city's always gone really you know the south side really was you know and it still is to some extent but yeah that's that's the biggest change is, is where you know you can you can um walk up and down, you know, the streets there and it's 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 a lot more um it's definitely a lot more like new residents and there's still some old, old residents left, still quite a few, but it's not it's not like uh this this um you know I mean you wouldn't hear you wouldn't hear English basically from even on the Lower East Side, from Rivington Street across the bridge it was pretty much all um mostly Caribbean Spanish speaking people, you know. And then a few a few of us. <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about what you do with Nighthawk 
Um, well, with Nighthawk, um, I mean, I you know a, a little bit of everything really, but the main the main focus for me here is, is basically like you know director programming. Um, uh, there's other people in the cinema department now, but basically it was it's just you know uh, producing live events. You know, I do a series called Music Driven, where we have a music a music film, whether it's a documentary or a concert film, and try to get talent out for it. Somebody who's either in the band or somebody who directed it. Um, and then, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the Brunch to Midnight series we do, which we take up over, over a month and, you know, um, do a theme for Midnight and Brunch. And then, you know, so basically it's just, you know, thinking of stuff to do and, and um, stuff that people would be interested in coming to. We try to frame it so we can be a little bit subversive where we can throw in one film that's challenging with maybe two other ones that people know so they kind of understand maybe I should check this out too that's basically something I learned at the video store was um, you know somebody who said they couldn't watch subtitles it's like alright give me six months with you and I'll I'll soften you up and you'll you know I, I know the route to take you know start out with day for night or something and then you can build up to stuff you know that's that's really satisfying is when because that's kind of how I got into it was, was just you know you, you find that one film that kind of is your gateway and then it opens up a whole other world to you know. Like I, I, I wasn't interested or cared about experimental or like non-narrative stuff. But back then, back in the '90s, there was a big demand for it. So I had to kind of become something of an expert in the field, or at least understand it and understand what people wanted to see because that was we were getting asked for it a lot. So you know, and then you learn. Um, it isn't about my it, it, when you. It isn't about my taste at all. You know, it's about what's what's going to play, what people are going to enjoy, and. And uh, that's that's really what it's about, as far as like programming films. I think you know. Again, I like it to be very populist, where yeah. um, you know, I don't I don't think there's any hierarchy or, or I just I just detest any kind of snobbery with that with that thing. Because who's to say really? Yeah. Everybody's taste is valid. How do you think Nighthawk in particular fits into the I guess, sort of changing culture of the community as it is now? Um, well, even you know it's. It's only a few years ago. I mean, and, and now that I'm the older I get, the more that it seems like it's it's you know longer ago than it than it really was. But um, you know, people were buying bikes and yelled shit at us when we you know having no idea who was involved in this place. Mm -hmm. um, you're like, oh, I'll go back to the Hamptons. Or whatever. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So it's um, yeah, because I think I mean I think that's the perception around any business that's really newer and yeah. shinier and yeah, that's part of that wave. Of um, so, I mean, I think it fits in where, you know, we've, we've had people in here that I've known, you know, um, David Carlton Bright, who ha does, who's a video documentarian who's been shooting around here for a long time. We've had him in. He has a, you know, video series in 3D that he's doing, kind of how it's changing. Um, you know, we've had bigger people like Gal Jenner from the Bad Brains. Like, we, really, it's, it's um, you know... Uh, it's it's really it's it's kind of like you know, uh, I think we're, we're, the way we approach it is we're definitely thinking forward, but we're also approaching it f that we're all very informed. We should, we know it's who's who's out here and, and what the history out here. Um, you know, I've 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 seen it happen, been a part of it happening. Um, you know, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. I know that there's you know, people getting displaced and stuff, but that's you know. Um, I don't know. It just it, a, a Tom's article came out. I think it was when they rezoned it out here, and it just seemed like there was higher forces at work, because the article was, you know, painted a picture that was so inaccurate. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it's all porno shops, and mm -hmm. it's like, there's not <laughs> one. I would, I wouldn't know about it. You know, so, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it is, it is, it is negative that you lose a little bit of, of, of. Um, of that edge, but then you know I think that it's it's your it's your responsibility to do something about it, to take you know take what was positive about the past and 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 don't ever live your life looking backwards you know because you, you can't you just can't change it you know yeah. and you know the pendulum sw will swing you know I mean there's there's always a boom and bust in New York so um, you know I mean I, I grew up hearing from the adults like you know how safe it was <laughs> you know what I mean and now uh, um, you know I, I you know I don't I try not to uh, to romanticize the past at all but now I hear people my peers talking about how dangerous it was you know 
-hmm. So, um, you know, and maybe people feel like, you know, well, I had to earn it, you know, whether you grew up out here and were born here or, or, or um, whether you came out here early on or any, any neighborhood, really. So maybe there's a little bit of, of resentment where it's like, well, you just come in and it's all, it's all here, you know. But, you know, I mean, I, again, this is something that I've heard, you know, when I first started going to punk shows, it was, there was older people telling me like, oh, no, this, this is bullshit. When it was the Ramones and television and, and talking heads, that was when it was good. You know, I'm sure that people who went to those shows said, no, this sucks when it was the Fillmore and it was, you know, it was 10 years after and, and, and Black Sabbath and, you know, Pink Floyd's first tour, that was when it was, you know. So there's always, you know, there's always um, people that are going to are gonna not acknowledge what's going on now. Um, so that's, that's kind of, I think, uh, you know, obviously you look around here and there's a lot of history. These are my posters and my videotapes and everything, but... Um, you know, it's it's we play these tapes and people look at these posters. It isn't like it's just a this you know, this like false monolith. Mm -hmm. It's you know, the stuff's actually still vital. You know, so that's kind of I think, me personally, I can't speak for everybody else, but you know, I like to to you know just kind of mind the past and let it inform what you're doing now, and and then make something new out of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like hip-hop used to be or like a lot of music you could point to you know um that's kind of, i mean that's a pretty general statement but that's i think probably the best way i could explain it what's kept you in the neighborhood oh wow <laughs> i mean you know a lot of my friends like uh like i said a lot of people you know um i i, I moved off bedford avenue um i kept the sublet till not, not that long ago but I, I moved off bedford avenue because it was just um, I mean, I had a tiny place. It was I could answer the front door from the bathtub. It was in the kitchen, and you know, I'm not I'm exaggerating. Um, I loved that apartment, but it was just you know I, I I was with somebody that was that was you know we were, we were married and everything, and and um, we needed more space, and you know I have children now, and um, it was just Bedford Avenue it was you know it was. Um, I just couldn't stay. It was just getting like like Mardi Gras, you know. It was really hard to walk and get a coffee in the morning, and it was becoming more of like a party spot than a residential, you know. Which is, you know, whatever. That's that's kind of what Bedford Avenue was built for anyway. It was, you know, it was empty storefronts that were once full, and then they were empty again. Now they're they're full again. So um, honestly, really, like after the video store, like in two thousand eight, when the, the two closed out here, and it was, I was just in a bad way. Uh, career-wise what kept me out in the neighborhood was that I needed to make a living and I was lucky enough to have friends that, that owned bars that let me you know work as a bar back or I worked I worked as a doorman at, at Zabrowski's on North 6th Street um, so and did other things you know production jobs I kind of went back you know I was 40 but I was doing stuff that I was doing when I was 21 again you know not by choice you know because I'd spent over a decade building something that just kind of yeah. um, so that's what kept me out here was was uh, you know needing to make a living and also too I felt like you know I don't know I felt wanting to do this out here was that I I really felt like it could work out here um, you know there was other people involved obviously that felt the same way um, but uh, you know I just I don't know I felt like well yeah I mean there there is there is still a great element out here you know I mean. Um, you know, it's it's. There's no reason to be 100% negative about it because you know, people th the thing people complain about, like you know. Maybe it's true. I guess it is true, but it's it's really invisible to me because I'm just so focused on on doing what I do out here. Um, I still come out here to hang out once in a while, but it's it's you know. Not as much as I, as I used to, you know, really. So that's what's kept me out here is really, number one that you know, work. Need need to work, and the number two was really just you know, um, I felt like like um, you know, I had I just seen the change so much and been a part of it, and I just felt some kind of like like proprietary ship towards the place, you know, because mm -hmm. there really was nothing else going out here. Uh, there was Galapagos on North Sixth Street; they would show films and stuff, but really, um, um, I I like the fact that we that we didn't do it on purpose but with real life we created like a, a hub for people that were interested in film you know and it was really cheap you know to, to rent stuff and you could you know um, I always 
you know, we spent every dime, like, if a video store was closing, we'd go there and just buy all, all the tapes they had because I really wanted to, you know, to have, um, have everything available to everybody. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, um, y you can't do it on the same level here because there's only three screens. You can't, you know, we had probably 20,000 titles, I guess. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I do miss the kind of, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, like, you know, in the video store, you'd, you'd have, Ten conversations a day, where you'd give somebody four movies and stuff, and um, you know it was fun. Keep me on my toes. There was a lot of people who, who, you know, didn't appreciate it, but would complain or whatever. But you know, for the most part, that's the one thing I do miss about that dynamic. You still get it here, but it's maybe, maybe like once a week if you're lucky. You have that one-on-one -on -one where you meet somebody at a screening or whatever. You talk to them afterwards, you know. Um, but I think it's important is to is to you know. Um, you know, is I'm I'm still interested. I still I still feel like I have, uh, you know, more stuff to learn and more things to, to do. You know, um, it's just uh, you can't you can't really be complacent, <laughs> or, you know, around here. Anything else you want to add about the neighborhood or about your work? I don't know. I mean, I hope I covered it, some stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess really it's it's uh, you know. Um, you can you can get an image of reality now what it was like back then, but I think that you know, going through it, it's like I try to I try to like take take the um, the things that were positive back then and try to like you know translate into what's going on now. That's that's really uh, I think, and a lot of people do the same do the same thing. But that's um, you know, the cultural stuff has been covered you know pretty pretty heavy duty. <laughs> that's my experience with with um, what drew me out here was doing creative stuff and being interested in stuff and then that's what keeps me out here even though it's been yeah it's been you know I guess yeah a few, a few presidents <laughs> <since then. laughs> well thank you so much for your no time. problem